Hi folks, this is David Chadwick again from Tactics Studios. Uh, we're going to begin a whole new tutorial series. Uh, this is going to be associated with the building of a tower defense game. I've been looking forward to building this uh, tutorial for a long time. I've had several queries from folks asking that we do something like this. I think you're going to find it pretty interesting. Tower defense games are really popular. You find them all the time. And also they include features that you're going to find consistent across most games that you see uh, inside the uh, the Play Store. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in the trench. I think you're going to like this set of tutorials. Well, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's just show a couple quick snippets here just to give you an idea of the features that we're going to include in this game. Every good game needs to have a set of introductory splash screens, so we'll certainly include those. Um, every good game needs to have a set of levels, so as you complete one level successfully, you progress up to the next level, and then you have to have a level selection panel in order to pick which level you want to play next. Um, users need help. Uh, they need something that explains the rules of the game, so having a pop-up help screen or information screen is certainly a key part. A tower defense game, uh, you're going to be working against tanks. And so you have to have different types of tanks. They need to move along different uh, paths as they move from the edge of the screen towards an objective. And then you as the player need towers and the ability to drag and drop a tower to a pre-designated defensive position along one of those paths. Uh, there's a fire exchange between the tanks and the towers. And as your tower receives um, fire, its health will decrease. And then you can reinstate that by spending resources on it. You gain resources by destroying tanks. And lastly, at the end of all that tank progression, you'll have a victory condition. Either you'll meet those conditions and have a victory situation, or you'll be defeated. I hope you've had a chance to take a look at the introductory series of tutorials on Defold. It really provides you a great foundation of the building blocks, if you will, that you're going to need for building this tower defense game, as well as other games. It, it really gives you the, the background you need in terms of setting up your project, how to manage images, how to manage your atlas associated with those images, uh, how to deal with game objects, the movement of those game objects, collision objects that are associated with the interaction between various characters using game objects, how do you handle messaging and as well as how the graphic user interface works within the game. I have to admit I've kind of struggled a little bit on how to structure this second series of tutorials. As I look at how we uh, do most tutorials with game engines, whether it be Default or any of the other game engines out there, they tend to do a bottom-up build. They start with an empty project and it walks you through keystroke by keystroke how to build the game and um, I think for a beginner that's absolutely essential that's the way you can learn those features but it becomes a bit tedious because you're watching each and every keystroke every character typed in on the keyboard every movement of the mouse um, for a game such as this uh, that could become a 20 30 hour tutorial I don't know about you but I don't have the patience to watch through a tutorial of that length you know, for myself and for most of us, I think, uh, the way we learn how to, how to really apply some of the features in games is to take an existing game, we get a complete project, and we dissect it. We take it apart. We look at all its moving parts. We figure out how, we, how it works. Uh, we're not really interested in the time it takes to build it from the ground up. We really want to look at it from the top down. And so I'm going to actually apply that approach to this series of tutorials. Um, I've taken the total tower defense I'm breaking it down into six segments, if you will, each of which will be a complete build, each of which will have a, a unique project file associated with it. And we're going to start with the basic capabilities and like the layers of a cake, we're going to build on that and build the total tutorial over a series of six builds. I, I think it's going to be a little bit more efficient and hopefully uh, captures your attention. You know, when you build a tutorial like this, I've already built the game and now I'm going back and I'm trying to figure out how to best explain the various mechanisms that are embedded within it to perform certain functions. But before I get 
too deep into that, I thought it might be helpful to just kind of from a very strategic level, let's talk a little bit about the types of design considerations you go through. There's a lot of alternatives you kind of pick and choose from. And uh, I've got a little laundry list here I'm just going to spend just a couple of minutes on. Hopefully you find it helpful as you think about how you design your games. The first is Tower Defense is hardly a unique uh, game. Uh, there are scores of tower defense games out there uh, built for all kinds of different platforms. And uh, my goal was to find what I thought was pretty much consistent with the genre. Uh, I think that that's what you really want to see how they build it. I didn't want to come up with something totally new and different in terms of gameplay. I wanted to show you how to implement the type of gameplay that's uh, really out there in the marketplace. So that was, that was really the first thing. The second is it's kind of what's structured and what's freeform. And there was really two, uh, two categories of that as we put the game together. The first is associated with the, how do the, the enemy tanks come out into the gameplay heading towards their objective. And the first uh, concept would be to have a number of geometric points, X, Y locations with waypoints, and you have the tanks come in onto your game that way. The other would be to have them totally freeform, and they could move around and basically wave, depending upon the location of any deployed towers. At least what I saw is the, the, current, the current mode of the game is to have really a predefined path. I haven't found a tower defense game that doesn't do that, so I stuck with that. And secondly is, how do you deploy your towers? You just allow them to go anywhere on the screen? Or do you have a number of predefined locations for each scenario that you can drag and drop to? And uh, again, most of the games I saw really have this drag and drop feature associated with some predefined locations. So I, I kind of stuck with that, that general principle. I haven't found a tower defense game yet, at least none of the good ones, that don't have a lot of animations. Animations associated with... Uh, uh, firing of bullets, uh, explosions when, uh, when they hit, explosions when things get destroyed, uh, floating icons when either resources or health mo is modified based on some action in the game. So that was pretty consistent. I wanted to do that as well. The second batch of really design considerations, things I had to make a decision on, were more associated with uh, the default game engine and the mechanisms it uses. And the first really big decision was associated with collections. Um, do we have one a large main collection and we use that for all of the various scenarios, all of the levels? Or alternatively, do we have one collection for each scenario and then some main collection that loads them and unloads them as you pick and choose the scenario you want to play? I decided to stay simple on this one. Uh, either of those approaches work, but there's such close similarity in terms of the vast majority of what we're gonna design here associated with these levels. They're all really the same, except for geometries. I felt it was easier to go ahead and keep them all into one collection. Uh, you may come to a different conclusion as you design your game, but that's, that's kind of the conclusion I reached. The, the second is associated with our graphic user interfaces. Um, we can have one large, lots of nodes in it, graphic user interface, and then enable, disable various nodes, depending upon where we are in gameplay. Or we can have multiple graphic user interfaces that are brought in and activated or disabled, depending upon where we are in gameplay. I decided to go with having multiple graphic user interfaces, and you're going to see that as we get into each of these individual scenarios, that there's one graphic user interface for picking and choosing the level you want to play. There's a different graphic user interface associated with repair actions or upgrade actions associated with a tower. There's yet a different graphic user interface associated with a, a pop-up window that provides help to the end player. So again, uh, it's as my personal choice, you may come to a different conclusion, but that's kind of what I felt was more in line with what most game designs might, might approach. As you look at an individual character, I'm not going to say game object, I'm going to say character. And in our case, we have tank characters and we have tower characters. There's lots of components in there. There are um, various elements. There's a turret and then a body, for example, in a tank. 
So I've decided that each of those characters is going to be a collection in its own right. And within that collection, we'll have sprites, we'll have collision objects, we'll have scripts, things such as that. And that way, that entire collection is basically equates to that one game object. And I'm going to do that both for the tanks as well as for the towers. And in fact, because there's so many differences, I'm going to have three different collections associated with tanks for a type one, which is the lowest level tank, a type two, a medium level tank, a type three, and same thing with towers. So you're going to see three different types of collections for all of those. So then you get down into uh, how are you going to make sure that you don't have memory leakage problems? How are you going to make sure that you know when you spawn a tank, and we're going to use a spawning technique, a uh, collection factory uh, based spawn, how do you make sure that when it gets destroyed that you can pick and choose all the elements within that collection and make sure you delete each of those uh, using our game engine default? And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a spawn table. We're going to actually collect as we spawn a collection associated with a particular tank character, or we spawn a whole collection associated with a tower character. We're going to capture those IDs into a table. And then as it gets destroyed, we can go back to that table, find that entry and make sure we've eliminated each of those IDs and to avoid memory leakage types of challenges. I've already mentioned that, you know, we can have arrow-based keys. A desktop might use that. But for a, a mobile game, whether you're going to play it on a phone, you're going to play it on an iPad, you're going to play it on a, on a tablet, uh, Android tablet, um, drag and drop is probably the best mechanism for that user interface. So I've, I've included a drag and drop capability. That's, that's basically the way we're either going to click a button or we're going to drag and drop a, t a tower. And that's the way you interface with your game. Last but probably not least is, you know, we're going to have a lot of moving parts here. Uh, we're going to have a lot of graphic user interfaces. We're going to have a lot of scripts associated with various tank actions and tower actions and explosions and map sheets and uh, all the rest. We need something that has overall control over that whole schema. So you're going to see that there's going to be a controller script. And the controller, is, in my term, the controller is going to be that traffic cop that keeps all the all the various pieces in sync as we develop the game. So hopefully that's been helpful. Uh, I'm going to quit droning on here and let's go ahead and dive in and start actually building the game. Okay, let's do it. What did I say in that introductory tutorial? Never met a game developer yet that didn't jump on a whiteboard. Okay, let's just spend one minute on it. Let's just review what we're going to go through here in this tutorial for build number one. Uh, initially, we're going to go ahead and do the project setup. We're going to look at our game.project file, set the parameters there, double check our input bindings. We're going to load up all the images for this entire project, not just for this first build. I'd like to get that all done one fell swoop. Uh, we'll go ahead and create the atlases that contain both our standalone images as well as the animation groups that are related to those. Uh, we're going to load up some custom fonts. Uh, we're going to create our, our, our bootstrap collection, the main dot collection. We're going to create two graphic user interfaces, a main menu. That would be where we select our levels and the pop-up GUI, which is associated with the pop-up help screen. Uh, we're going to embed two common Lua modules, one that monitors our frames per second to just double check performance as we develop the game. The other is some common suites of uh, animation functions that we'll use for uh, images and windows and things such as that. And lastly, we'll do a deep dive into the full syntax for all of those Lua modules, as well as our script files and our GUI script files. You know, as we get ready to start our walkthrough, I'd, I'd suggest that you go ahead and download the Build One Tower Defense zip file using the shared Google Drive link that's provided in the YouTube comments here below. If you open it up, you're going to see that the project window, the asset window, is going to look just like this, showing each of the folders and each of the default components that comprise Build One of the Tower Defense project. And then if you open up Main Collection, you'll see how that's structured as well. So at this point, we're now ready to go ahead on a step-by-step -step basis and review each of the components in this build. Okay, let's go ahead and start with a deep dive into a completed build one project. 
As you can see here, uh, we have a total of five segments associated with Build 1. And uh, that first segment that we're going to start right now is associated with the project setup. Let's go ahead and quickly run through this Phase 1 Tower Defense project. You're really pretty familiar with the setup elements already because we walked through each of those during our previous introductory default tutorials. So you're really not going to find any surprises here. Minor tweak. For this project, I've gone ahead and renamed the project folder to be Tower Game, just to differentiate it a little bit. So, as I open up the game.project, let's go ahead and walk through the major parameters here. I have set the uh, project title to uh, Build 1, uh, Default Tower Defense Tutorial Opening Sequence, and I'll retain the version number as uh, version number 1. And as you can see here, I've uh, kept the main collection as designated that as the bootstrap, aka that's going to be the collection that executes every time you start your game. And we are going to use the default renderer. I've decided to stay with the 1024 pixel width and the 768 pixel height screen size. That reflects the aspect ratio that's used on an iPad, but obviously you can change that uh, resolution to anything that meets the target platform you'd like to build your game for. Lastly, let's go ahead and double check the input bindings. As you see here under the mouse triggers, the input button one, that would be uh, the touch button on a uh, touching uh, on a mobile device or the left button on a, uh, a desktop device is associated with a touch action. Let's spend just a minute to, to just to talk a little bit about the images that are required for this project. If you look down here in the notes on the video, you'll see that there's a link to a Google Share Drive, um, uh, including a, uh, a zip file for all of the images associated with this project. And if you open that up, uh, you'll see that there's a series of six individual subfolders. And I've done that intentionally because there's six atlases that we're going to build in this project. And I've aggregated the images across each of those uh, six atlases. Anim assets 1, 2, and 3, graphic assets, map assets, and the pop-up assets. Within my default project, I've created a folder called TD Images. I dragged and dropped all the image subfolders from that zip file over into this project folder, as you can see here. As they say, hey, great images make great games. And there are several sources that I frequently go to that provide some very good images for free. I really want to thank each of them and urge you to take a look at what each of these sources can provide to you as you start building your own games. In particular, I want to thank Public Domain Vectors, Ink and Bones, Clipart Max, Free Game Assets, Open Game Art, PNG Tree, Nice PNG, and Clipart Wiki. Hey, of note also is that the online logo and text features provided by Textures for Photoshop, they're exceptional. Let's do a quick review of the contents of each of these atlases. I'm not going to go uh, item by item. I think it's best done as we get into the, where they're applied in the game. But let's just talk about the general structure of each of the atlases. First is Anim, Anim for Animation Assets 1. As you can see, that's an explosion sprite sheet. I've got an animation group that reflects explosion 1, where I've also set the frames per second to 50 and the playback to once forward, since you only want that really to be reflected once. Anim, Animation Assets 2. Atlas is another sprite sheet of explosions. Again, an animation group to reflect that called an explosion two. Again, setting the frames per second to 50 and a playback to once forward. Anim assets three is the last explosion animation group, slightly different color, exactly the same. I've designated that animation group to be explosion three. Again, 50 is the frames per second and once forward. The Graphic Assets Atlas is kind of a potpourri. There's a whole number of moving parts in here. There are a series of uh, standalone images to include buildings and logos and things such as that. And then there are also a large number of single image, you notice here a single image animation group associated with that. Now, the reason for the single image animation group is that way I can use the GUI play flipbook statement in our code that allows me to dynamically change the image for a GUI node so that I can change it from a pressed to an unpressed uh, level bar, for example. 
Um, and so I want to be able to invoke that capability for those. I'm the, I don't have to really worry about changing the frames per sec under the playback mode. I do have a map assets atlas in there. I do have a single standalone image, the level select panel three that you see here. And I've also got four single image animation groups, one for each of the three play level maps and one which is a multi image uh, waving flag animation where I've set the frames per second to six and a constant loop forward associated with it. And last but hardly least are all of the images associated with our pop-up assets. Put that into the pop-up assets atlas. I've got a number of individual images associated with that in that atlas. And I have uh, two single image animation groups. Uh, this would be the red button that's going to get you out of the pop-up back to the main game. I've got one for when it's pressed and one for when it's released. For this project, we're going to be using several unique fonts as part of the graphic user interface. I've gone ahead and placed them here in the fonts folder. For this project, we've included a Call of Duty Ops font, a Notice font, and a C-Lock font. And those are all freely available that you can download from www.dafont.com. I've also retained both the original .otf or .ttf file, that's the format you'd receive when you'd get them downloaded, as well as the default created font file, the .font file for each of them. And as you can see here, I'll open them up so you can take a look at what they look like. Uh, this is our Call of Duty font, the Notice font, and the C-Lock font. Now, as we work through the major folders here within the project window, you can see that we have two other folders that are pretty important. We have a modules folder. In there, we have two uh, Lua module files. One is our animation functions, and one is our FPS frames per second utility functions. Uh, we're going to walk through those in detail here in just a moment. And we've placed all of our scripts into a single repository, our scripts folder. And for this uh, first build, we have a total of four script files. We have a controller script, a map sheet script, and two GUI scripts, a main menu GUI script, and a pop-up window GUI script. Okay, back to our build plan. We're now ready for uh, segment two. This will be pretty uh, straightforward, actually. It's the main dot collection we're going to walk through. Uh, that's our bootstrap collection, as we indicated earlier. It consists of uh, four uh, game objects that we're going to walk through, and uh, that includes our controller, that includes the map sheet, that includes the main menu, and includes the pop-up window. You know, I, I think it's helpful to take a look at an illustration that highlights the key elements of our design. Uh, the project's going to get more complicated in the follow-on builds, but we're going to start with kind of the foundation here. So uh, this is for build one, the design structure. As you can see, um, it has a total of four game objects. Everybody's got their own style. I like to use my game objects as containers and I keep them segregated. I don't like to put a lot of different component files with different purposes in, in the same game object. So I have a controller game object that controls the controller as a component file, the controller script. I've got a map sheet, which also consists of a script as well as a, a sprite. And that sprite includes a, a image. I've got the uh, main menu, which is a game object that serves as a container for the main menu graphic user interface. And I have the pop-up window, which uh, is a container for the opening uh, pop-up window. Well, you can't get any more straightforward than that. I've gone ahead and opened up the main dot collection here. As you can see over in the outline, it directly reflects what we put into our design specification that we just walked through. We have a total of four game objects, controllers, container for its script, game map, which is a container for both the script for the map sheet and its sprite. Uh, and as you can see, we've pulled that sprite from the map assets atlas, and we're going to set it to level one to, to begin with. And we have the two GUI game objects, the container for the main menu GUI, and the container pop-up window for the opening pop-up GUI.
Okay, now we're going to go ahead and begin segment three of our build plan. Uh, this is going to be focused on our graphic user interfaces. Uh, we have two, as you see here. We have our main menu and we have the pop-up window. Let's just spend a minute and uh, go through uh, what the actual GUI nodes for the main menu graphic user interface are going to look like on your game screen. Uh, we have the splash background. And then we have our studio logo, in this case for Tactics Studios, so it's the TS logo. We have the version that we're using basically for debugging. It's going to reflect build one for this, and it'll have the subsequent builds as well. Uh, we've got our game logo. We have debug message one and debug message two up in the upper left-hand corner text messages that we'll be using as we debug uh, each of the individual builds. We have the level panel. We have a select bar, which also includes bar text and a lock. We have a notice, which is a user notification, and we have a level banner that indicates the victory or defeat conditions at the end of the game. I've placed a total of 10 graphic user interface nodes associated with the main menu. Uh, one of them, which I guess actually has two sub nodes. I have found it helpful to be able to summarize each of the node attributes in a simple design table looks a little bit like this, and you can use whatever works best for you. But doing this for me, it helps me when I'm working through the NUI node processes for adding each of the box and or text nodes that we have in the project. The nodes you see here encompass splash screen components, uh, debug messaging components, uh, a level selection menu, uh, user notifications, and a victory or defeat banner that we're going to show at the end of each game. Atlas references are going to be made to the three textures that are used across these nodes, specifically our graphic assets atlas, the map assets, and the pop-up assets. All three fonts are going to be referenced in our GUI, so we are using the Call of Duty Ops font, the Notice font, and the C-Lock font. And I've decided to designate three distinct layers in order to maintain the Z order across each of the multiple nodes. So I have at the very bottom a background layer, on top of that is a buttons layer, and on top of that is a notices layer. And finally, the GUI is going to have a unique script file, in this case, main menu.gui script. Okay, now let's see how that specification is actually reflected in the project itself. Let's start with textures. That's pretty straightforward. As we indicated, it is cited in the spec where you're going to use images from all three of the atlases, graphic assets, map assets, and pop-up assets. And we're going to use all the same three fonts, the notice font, the C-Log font, the Call of Duty font. And lastly, we've defined the three layers, background on the bottom, buttons on top of that, and notices on top of that. Now let's take a look at each of our nodes. Uh, we have a TS logo node. I've centered that on the screen at 512.384. It reflects the TS logo texture. And I've placed it in the notices layer. I have a splash background that's going to be centered on the screen as well at 512.384. I'm going to reference the splash background out of our graphic assets uh, atlas. And I'm going to place it in the background layer. I have a game logo. I place that at 528 and 379, not quite center. I've kind of offset it a little bit based on the nature of the image. I've cited the texture as the game logo. And again, I've placed this in the notices layer. I have two debug messages. I've identified their position. I've set some default text, but I'm going to override that in dynamically in our code. I've set the font at C-Lock, color for maroon, both for the color and for the outline. I've placed it in the notices layer, and I've set the pivot to northwest. De de debug message two is almost the same, a slightly different location. You'll notice I have changed the scale of the font to make it a little bit smaller so it's not quite as obtrusive when I'm uh, doing my, def uh, my debugging. I have a level panel. That's going to be the, uh, the background, if you will, behind the menu where you pick the different uh, levels that you can play in the game. I center it on the screen. I identify the texture. 
I place it in the button layer. Select bar GUI node is slightly different. Uh, I really want to create a template, if you will, that I'm going to clone within the game to reflect level one, level two, and level three of play. So I'm going to offset it from the rest of the, uh, the GUI nodes. I'm going to put it over here. Uh, it has three elements itself. I've got the bar, the black bar you see here underneath it. I've identified its location. I've set a scale associated with it. And I've identified the texture associated with that. And I've kind of made it a little uh, transparent. I've set the alpha set to 0 0.75. I place some text on top of that. Uh, this position is relative to the select bar itself because it's a sub node to select bar. So I've set the X position to a minus 250 and Y to minus four. I've given it uh, the text that I want to have displayed. I've identified the font as the notice font and I've kept the color uh, as white. But interesting or importantly, I've uh, set the layer to notices and the pivot to west. So it's pivoting on the far left hand most side. And then I also have a lock image. Again, relative to its parent, I've located it at a minus 310x and a minus 4 in the y position. I've identified the texture associated with it, which is out of the graphic assets uh, atlas as the lock. Put it in the notices layer. I have a notice, which provides a user notification. I located it at 508 and 400, slightly off center. Identify its texture as the standby notice under the graphic assets atlas. And I set it into the notices layer. I have a level banner, that's what you can see actually here. That's whether you win or lose. That's centered on the screen. Identify its texture as the red victory banner. Put it into the notices layer. And last but not least is the version. Uh, I'm using this for debug purposes. So I've put it down in the bottom right hand corner of the screen at X950 and Y of 20. I've changed the scale so it's a little bit smaller again so it doesn't disrupt you as you're doing your debugging. I've given it some dummy text. I'm going to override that in my code. I've set the font to notice font and I've given it a, a light green as its color base. Set its alpha to 0.8. Set the layer to notices and set the pivot to center. Okay, as we dive into the pop-up window graphic user interface, uh, like we did before, let's go ahead and just spend a minute, take a look at what each of those GUI nodes physically looks like on your game screen. Uh, first, we have the pop-up window GUI node, which uh, includes uh, actually all the other nodes as subnodes. It's the parent. Uh, we have a game logo. We have a title one with text one. We have title two with text two. And then in the lower right-hand corner, we have a return button, which is actually the parent for another uh, text node button label. Always have to have a design spec. So let's go ahead and take a look at the design spec associated with the opening pop-up GUI. As you can see that there's a parent GUI node associated with the opening pop-up, pop-up window. And that has a total of six subnodes. Since we want to control the enabling and the disabling of all these GUI nodes at the same time within the pop-up, whether we want to do that together, using a parent provides a pretty simple structure for doing that. For example, if we disable the parent, it disables all the subnodes as well. And if we enable the parent, then it enables all the subnodes. The parent GUI node contains a background image and the subnodes that encompass each of the key elements, a game logo, a title one, and associated text one underneath that a title number two, and a group of text associated with that title. And then a return button that lets the user close the pop-up and return to the game. As you can see, we have Atlas references made to two of the textures, uh, specifically graphic assets and pop-up assets. We have all three fonts referenced, Call of Duty, Notice, and C-Lock. And as we did in the previous uh, GUI, I've decided to use the same three layers to maintain the Z order. Background on the bottom with buttons on top of that and notices on top of that. And finally, this GUI has a unique script file, popupwindow.guiscript. And we do a deep dive into that script file and all the other script files here in the next section. Let's go ahead and open up the GUI. 
take a look at it in the outline window. Shouldn't see any surprises here. We have our two textures identified, pop-up assets and the graphic assets. We have our three fonts, Notice, Call of Duty, and C-Lock. Let me move this down a little bit. We have our three layers, background buttons, and notices. Let's go ahead and take a look at the nodes. We have our parent pop-up window. That's the parent node. Underneath that, we have our game logo. The game logo is uh, located at an X of uh, minus 254, again, relative to the pop-up window parent, and a Y of 111. I've modified the scale somewhat so that uh, it doesn't overpower the rest of the screen. So I've made it at a 0 0.4, both for the X and the Y scaling. Identify the game logo out of the graphic assets atlas as a texture. I've placed it in the notices layer. Have the return button located down here in the lower right. Uh, I've located that at the X of 289 and a Y of minus 249. Now remember that's relative to the parent, relative to the pop-up window parent. I set the texture to be return released, aka we want it to start with it not having been pressed yet. And I place it in the notices layer. I want to put a label on top of that. So I've identified a button label as a sub node to the return button. Again, relative to the return button location, the button label will be at an X of minus two, a Y of plus two. I've changed the scale to 0.5 so it fits nicely inside the, the image associated with the button. I've put the return, the text return on there. I'm using the notice font for that. And I've identified this the layer as the notices layer and the pivot to be center. I have, have a title and text associated with that title. So title one is located relative to the pop-up window parent at minus 67 at the X position and 186 on a Y. I've changed the scale to be 0.8. I've put some dummy text in there that will dynamically change in our code. I've set the font to be the Call of Duty font. I've modified the color. Obviously, you can set it to whatever color you feel comfortable with. I've put it in the notices layer and changed the pivot to be the northwest in the upper left-hand corner of it. The text underneath that, minus 63 in the X, 106 on the Y. Change the scale to 0 0.7. I'm going to modify it dynamically so I really don't care what it says here in the dummy node. I changed the font to C-Lock. I've identified a color associated with it. I've put it in the notices layer. I've changed the pivot for this to be the Northwest. Title two and text two are pretty much the same, except that I've, I've got a separate set, putting them down here into this space down here. Title two is at an X of minus 381 as, as compared to the pop-up window parent. A Y of minus 71, a scale of 0.6, some dummy text, Call of Duty for the title would be the font. I've modified the color. I've placed it in the notices layer. I've set the pivot to be the Northwest. Last but not least on the uh, pop-up window GUI, I have text two located at X of minus 377, Y of minus 140, a scale of 0 0.7. I modified the text dynamically in code. I've set the font to C-Lock. I've set the color, change it to whatever color you'd like. I've set it to the notices layer. I've set the pivot to Northwest. And that completes our opening pop-up GUI. Let's now start the segment four. Uh, in segment four, we're going to focus on our script files. Uh, we're going to do a quick design review just to show how each of the individual scripts interrelate with each other. Uh, and then we're going to do a deep dive into the line-by-line -line syntax associated with each. So as you see here on our list here on the left, 
We're going to be looking at the controller script, which is really the overall game controller, if you will. We're going to look at a very short script associated with the map sheet. Uh, we're going to take a look at two GUI scripts, the main menu GUI script and the pop-up window GUI script. And then lastly, we're going to look at the two Lewis script files that are inside our uh, module. So the first would be the FPS util, that's our uh, frames per second unit utility. And then we'll also look at the animation functions Lua file. I've included two Lua modules that support common support functions for both this project as well as other projects that we're going to work on. This is a good habit to get into. It sure makes maintaining your code base a bit more manageable. The first module, fpsutil.lua. I've extracted this routine from a robust set of default uh, metric routines that were prepared by Bjorn Ritzel, who is a developer on the default team. The FPS Util Lua module contains a function which updates and captures the frames per second being attained by your default game. This is very useful in ensuring that you don't have any program logic which is dramatically affecting game performance. The second module, AnimationFunctions.Lua. This module consists of a series of animation cascades. Those are animations that call a follow-on animation when complete. The Lua module includes cascades for both the studio and game logo splash screens, as well as generalized animations for image, button, and window displays. Now let's look at the major scripts within this project. For each script, the diagram is going to identify the major elements of game logic, including the standard default Lua declarations, init, on message, update. Within the controller script, we set a require for the FPS util module, and we also initialize a set of global variables, essentially the major game parameters used throughout the game, number of tank strikes, number of levels, things such as that. Then we're going to randomize the seed used by the random number generator and disable and hide the map during initial game startup. Three messages are processed within this controller. Splash complete, display, display the game pop-up, and start selected level. We'll describe each of those in detail shortly. And lastly, we update the FPS util function each update cycle. The map sheet script performs a single function. It processes an update map version message, which invokes the play animation to its sprite component that changes the image to reflect the current active gameplay level. We have two GUI scripts. The first is the main menu GUI script. In that, in that script, after we set the local variable to the animation function and we declare a set of local functions, the main menu GUI script is initialized within the init function. Here we acquire input focus and I set a series of script properties capturing the ID of each of the GUI nodes and then disable those nodes for initial game startup and the splash screen sequence. We're going to process four messages within the main menu, the show main menu, Disable Control Nodes, Show Node, and Hide Node. We're also going to set the debug messages within the Update function. And finally, both an Action Pressed and an Action Released message are captured and processed associated with user input related to the level selection bars. The second GUI is the Pop-Up Window. And the Pop-Up Window GUI script is very similar to a main menu. It requires functions within the Animation function Lua module and it also declares several local animation functions that are unique to this game. The init function acquires input focus and sets the script properties for the IDs of each GUI node, and it also disables the parent for all those nodes during game startup. The key message processed within pop-up window is the show pop-up window, which obviously displays all the nodes related to the user help pop-up. The input function processes both an action pressed and an action released message associated with user inputs on the return button. So with that quick overview as background, let's go ahead and walk through the actual source code for each of these files and see how this functionality is actually implemented. Okay, as we start our uh, detailed walkthroughs of each of the script files, Probably the first thing as you look at the screen now is you're saying, hey, wait a minute, that's not the default uh, editor. No, it's not. This is actually Microsoft uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, it's a free editor. You can download it, download it from their site pretty simply. Um, I like it. I, uh, there's a, uh, a preference that you can set. Uh, that allows it to deal with Lua code. I found it really integrates well 
with the uh, the default game engine editor, and um, I've I've come to really like using it, uh, and uh, I'd suggest you give it a try. Let's go ahead and start with the controller dot script. You know, I always have a controller in most of my application projects. I, I use it as really the hub for all the major game logic so that you're not splitting the real driving logic across multiple different script files. Uh, I just find it easier for maintenance as well as for upfront development. Um, so let's go ahead. As you can see, I have an initial opening header uh, set of comments. Um, you're going to see that throughout all of my projects. It identifies the name of the project. I like to give the dimensions, at least the screen dimensions that I'm targeting, identifies the script file, and gives a real short summary of what the script is, uh, is actually accomplishing. As we get into the detailed execution here, you'll notice that the first thing I'm doing is invoking a Lua module. And that module is the module that uh, checks for frames per second. Uh, Bjorn Ritzel on the default team has put this out on GitHub. I use it uh, pretty frequently. It makes sure that I don't have any um, negative impacts on performance uh, based on things I'm doing during the debugging sequence. Now, you'll notice that um, I'm using the require statement uh, in the introductory series. I go through that in some detail. Require is what actually loads the given module. And uh, the recommended way of using it is to store the result in a local variable. And then you can use that local variable because it now stores all the functions in that module. Um, and then you can invoke it using uh, the local variable that you identify basically as a pointer. Although it's not really a hard and fast rule, uh, using local variables for these modules actually does improve your game performance, and I find it also increases the overall program readability. Okay, the next thing we see is that we have some debugging measures. Uh, I've included uh, two global variables, debug uh, underscore message one and debug message two. Uh, those are gonna basically describe and be displayed on, on the screen. Uh, we'll see that here in a little bit. And I use that as I debug in conjunction with my print statements. I have declared a set of uh, global variables. Um, as you see here, uh, th since this is the first time we're really reviewing code in this particular video series, uh, I'm gonna get into some of my best practices. I would recommend you follow them, but obviously that's your call. But I always like to put the definition of my variables off on the right-hand comment, uh, particularly as you come back uh, to a script file. If you haven't been at it for a while and you've, you've got a short memory like I do, it's easy to kind of forget, well, what exactly does this accomplish? So I'm gonna, you're going to see that, and that'll help you as you identify each of these. I've got the version number that I display just to make sure I know which build I'm working on as I look at the execution screens. I've got some bypass global variables. You know, as I'm in the debugging phase, I really don't want to sit through the splash screen sequence each and every time. So if I set that bypass splash to true, then I can skip right past it. Same with the pop-up panel associated with user instructions. Sometimes I just want to bypass that. Sometimes I want to bypass the menu because I want to go directly into a particular level. So I have uh, some uh, bypass uh, global variables associated with that. And same with labels on the game objects and my print function. When I get into the true execution of the game, I've got three global variables. I've got the number of game levels. In this case, there's going to be a total of three levels in this game. What is the active level that I'm executing right now? And obviously, as I initiate the game, I want to start at level number one. And then I define how many tank strikes by enemy tank units are there going to be within each level. And in this particular case, as you can see, it's four. I also declare a global function. This is that dprint function I talked about earlier. So if the bypass print is false, uh, it's going to print it. But if bypass print is true, uh, then it won't. And so you can bypass easily all your print statements without extracting them from your code. I do have a local function. In this particular case, I only have one. It's the start selected level. 
you know, if you're going to bypass the level selection panel, you need something that kick off, kicks off that uh, initial uh, level. So if the bypass menu is true, in other words, you're going to bypass that selection menu, then it sets the active level to whatever you set in that bypass level global variable. And then it sends two messages out, one to the game map to enable the map. The other is uh, to up update that map level to whatever image is associated with the active level that you've just set. In my initialization, in addition to acquiring input focus, the first thing I do is I randomize the seed that's going to be used by the random number generator so that each time you run the game, it's going to be different. And I do that based on looking at the system clock. I initialize the strike, the current strike, to one. Uh, so that basically sets the game off from with strike number one. And then I'm going to go ahead and disable that map, the game map, uh, and we'll do that during the splash screen sequence. And then once that done, we'll go ahead and re-enable. The update process uh, for the controller, at least in build number one, is pretty simplistic. It's going to be solely focused on our frames per second utility. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to update that every cycle. Uh, DT is the number of milliseconds between the the previous frame and the current frame. And then we're going to take that and we're going to display inside our debug message, we're going to create a string uh, that includes the average milliseconds uh, per frame, as well as the average or the current uh, frames per second. There are a number of message IDs that are processed by the controller. Again, the controller is going to be the game logic hub of the application. So the first is when the, when it receives a splash complete. Splash complete is sent to it once all of the introductory studio and game logos are completed. And then when it receives that, uh, the controller is going to send a message back to the main menu graphic user interface that indicates go ahead and show the main menu. So if the user hasn't bypassed the pop-up panel, then we're going to go ahead and display the introductory panel. So we're going to do that when we receive the display game pop-up message ID. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, send a message to the main menu graphic user interface to go ahead and disable all of its control nodes. Then we're going to enable the game map. So we enable the game map object. Uh, then we post to, to the map sheet. Uh, the instruction to update the map version and setting the map level to the current map level associated with the active level that we're on, either level one, level two, or level three. Uh, so as we do that, uh, we're going to have do that on a timer. Uh, we're going to delay by about half of a second, and then we're going to go ahead and send the pop-up window graphic user interface a, uh, a message ID of show the pop-up window. And then we're going to have a series of parameters that are sent over uh, in, in conjunction with that message. Title 1 and text 1, title 2 and text 2. And the last step associated with the pop-up panel is to go ahead and set a flag, setting that global variable bypass menu to true. That way we're not going to display the information panel each and every time we come through the menu. When the controller receives the message start selected level, that's when we're going to go ahead and start with the current self-current strike and begin the actual gameplay. So we're going to enable the game map. We're going to send a message to the main menu graphic user interface to go ahead and now enable all of the control nodes. We're going to make sure that the map sheet is associated with the uh, image associated with the current uh, map version. And then we're going to start the function start selected level. The map sheet script is uh, pretty straightforward, it really has a single function. Uh, again, we have a header comment section that identifies the project and the script file name and a quick summary. Uh, this is simply a message processor. Upon receipt of a update map version message, uh, it uses that as the parameter for sending a message to the sprite which is the sprite contains the actual map image. It plays the animation associated with that map level. So I can switch the map to level one, or I can switch it to level two, or switch it to level three. Let's go ahead and walk through the GUI scripts associated with each of our graphic user interfaces. 
Uh, as you see here, the main menu GUI script supports logic related to the main menu. That includes the opening splash screens and the level selection panel, and those are both highlighted here within the header comment section. For this GUI script, we're going to be invoking functions contained within the Animation Functions Lua module. The requirement statement provides a pointer into a local variable that will enable us to call those functions throughout the rest of this script. You'll see I've also declared a local variable, Scenarios, and that provides the text related to the titles for each of the three levels of gameplay. There is a local function, Reset Level Selection Panel, which will be called each time the level panel is displayed. This function performs several steps. First, it enables the GUI node for the panel background. Secondly, it enables the select bars and places a lock image on a bar if it is not yet available for play. And then lastly, it applies some scaling animation to each level when that level is available for play by the user. This GUI script also contains three local functions that support GUI node animation. Fade out, fade in, and scale animation. These are applied to the GUI nodes, which are identified within the input parameter to each. Another local function is declared, initialize game. This is called when the game is initialized since it generates each of the level selection bars by cloning a GUI node tree. Then it positions that bar onto the level select background. Lastly, these level select bars are disabled during the animations associated with the opening splash screens. Game initialization is conducted within the init function. This includes first declaring a series of script properties as highlighted here. Note, it's best practice in the establishing a script property for each of the GUI node IDs. It really improves overall game performance. Then the GUI nodes are all disabled as a starting point for kicking off the opening splash screens because we don't want the, the various level selection bars showing up at the same time our splash screens are showing. And then lastly, I've included a bypass menu global variable. This allows you to skip the entire level selection process and proceed directly to a specific level. And that specific level is the global variable bypass underscore level. The onMessage function provides logic for four distinct message parameters. First, show main menu. Disable control nodes. Show a node and hide a node. The onInput function provides logic related to the pressing of one of the level selection bars. And when pressed, it changes the image of the bar using the GUI.play flipbook. When the viewer releases, the, it first sets the active level. Then the GUI nodes within the main menu are disabled since it's now time to play the game level and you don't want the menu interfering with that. And finally, a message is sent to the controller directing that the introductory game pop-up window be displayed. Or it simply starts a selected level if the bypass panel was set to true. Lastly, the update function allows you to reset all the debug messages to blank. If you actually want to see the debug message, go ahead and comment out those two lines of code and then they'll show up since in the, as you see here, the contents of the two global variables are paste, placed into the GUI text nodes. The last script to review in this build is the pop-up window. The, this particular GUI script supports logic related to the pop-up window graphic user interface. That's the GUI that provides user help information to the player. Similar to main menu, the pop-up window GUI script does also requires the animate functions Lua module. There are several additional animation functions that I've declared here as local functions to include expand pop-up, fade in a pop-up, shrink a pop-up, and fade out the pop-up. Initialization is conducted within the init function that includes acquiring input focus, 
setting the script properties for each of the GUI nodes within the pop-up window, and then disabling the pop-up window nodes since the game is now initialized and ready to begin. Only a single message parameter is addressed within the onMessage function, and that's the quote show pop-up window. This sets the content for the pop-up window based on the content of each of the message parameters for Title 1, Text 1, Title 2, Text 2. And then it goes ahead and fades in that pop-up. The onInput function supports the pressing of the return button on the pop-up window. This first, when clicked, changes the image of the button when the user clicks it, and then upon release, fades out the pop-up window, and finally sends a message to the controller to start the selected level. Let's start with a quick script walkthrough of FPS utils. This module really consists of a single function, an update function, which calculates variables that you can invoke using the pointer m. Specifically, m.fps provides the current frames per second. Now let's do a quick script walkthrough of animation functions. This module provides both window, button, and image animation functions all within the table M. Let's focus on a few of the highlights. The splash screen sequence is initiated when you call the m.animateTSLogo1 function, which changes scale and starts with an alpha of zero, aka invisible, fading to full opacity, and then a scale of 135, and then it calls m.animateTSLogo2 in a cascading sequence. AnimateTSLogo2 go ahead and animates the scale back to 100%. Then after a delay, uh, it goes to TSLogo3, which fades the logo back to an alpha of zero, and then calls AnimateGameLogo1. That function performs a similar animation sequence. It cascades into AnimateGameLogo2, and then AnimateGameLogo3, when this entire cascade is completed, a message is passed to the controller indicating that the splash screen sequence is complete. There's a similar cascade used for the animation of GUI images. A different animation sequence is provided for button release and button press, changing scale and opacity. Finally, animation cascades are provided for displaying a pop-up window GUI node. We're now going to wrap up uh, tutorial number one. Uh, the final segment, segment five, is a final build. Uh, if you've downloaded the project as a zip file, you've opened it up, and hopefully you've had a chance to walk through it as we've kind of done this deep dive, uh, now would be the time to actually conduct a build. Um, if there were any errors, if you made any uh, changes to syntax or whatever the case may be, now would be obviously the time to resolve those. And if not, let's go ahead and uh, do a quick run through just to see how the functionality we've walked through is reflected in a game. Well, it's not quite a game yet, but in the application as we've built it. Okay, we're running through the game now, and as you can see, it opens up with a studio logo that fades up into the screen on top of the screen background. Then it fades back, immediately followed by the game logo that uh, fades itself back up uh, into full uh, opacity and then goes back to transparent. Then we open up with a uh, level selection panel. Uh, it has a background associated with it and three level select bars. You can see that scenario one is available because that's the first scenario. Uh, scenarios two and three are locked because you haven't successfully completed level one yet. Uh, if you select scenario number one, it immediately opens up a uh, pop-up help screen. Uh, right now, I've simply summarized what's going on in build one. Obviously, for a real game, I'd put in some better user instructions. 
when you close that panel using the return button, you're now at the scenario number one game screen, which is actually going to be the starting point for tutorial number two. Hey, thanks so much for joining me on this uh, tutorial series. I'm hoping you're finding it uh, helpful. Uh, this first tutorial really just sets a foundation, but from this, I think you're going to find the follow-on tutorials are going to build on that and create that tower defense game that you're looking for. I sincerely appreciate any comments you might have uh, down here below here on YouTube. If you have any recommendations of uh, ways I can improve this tutorial, I'd really appreciate that. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe. I, I, I find that very helpful if you could. Uh, as you see also in the comments below, there is a link uh, to a shared uh, Google Drive. And on there, you'll find a zip file uh, for Tower Defense Build 1. And that would provide the full project, the full default project that you need so that you can load that up uh, during the course of this particular tutorial. Uh, we've now set the foundation, and I think you're going to find tutorial number two is going to add a little bit more character to the game. We're going to focus on the enemy tank profile, profiles. Uh, there's going to be three different types of tanks. There's going to be multiple paths through uh, the various map scenarios associated with those tanks. So I think you're going to find that to be pretty interesting. So I look forward to seeing you here next time. Hey, thanks again. Appreciate it. Bye now.